Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of being the, um, they call me the president and CEO of the Lighthouse for the Blind, but really I just work with some really great people and it makes it a lot of fun to go to work. So uh, while they give me that moniker, it really is um, everyone that works for us that makes uh, the Lighthouse such a successful place. Um, my name is Platt Allen, and with me today are Nancy Fisher, who most of you all know, uh, who runs our community development organization and has been extremely instrumental, along with Molly Johnson in the back taking photographs, um, with getting our whole week of uh, celebrating Michael and his story and sharing him and his, uh, his dog Africa uh, with our community. I think today marks the 22nd event, and I think we've been in front of somewhere between uh, 3,500 and 4,000 people. So we've had an extraordinary opportunity to share Michael and, and really bring a gift to our community. So Michael, we appreciate you coming. We appreciate you being part of our community today and certainly we appreciate you uh, sharing your story with the fine folks here at First Methodist. So um, without any further ado, uh, I think we have one copy of his book remaining. So if you were the last one, then uh, we'll raffle that off at the end or something. <laughs> Um, Michael, it's all yours. And since it's the last one, the price goes up tremendously. I just <laughs> thought I'd let you know. Well, thank you for coming to our latest course in physics in the universe. Today, it's Does God Have a Sense of Humor? And um, I think he does, but or she. I don't care what gender you choose, but there you go. It's really fun to be here and speak at a Methodist church. I've had opportunities to speak in Nashville at the upper room during some prayer services, and mm, we need to do this. <clears throat> Anybody here ever participated in the Walk to Emmaus? Yes. De Caloris. I, um, if you have not, it is, it is something that is absolutely worth doing. It's called a short course in Christianity. It's not for newbies to the church, but it's to help develop leadership, and it is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And then when you get to be a lay director, it's even more fun, because it's all about service, and I won't give it away. So you've got some people up here in the front who have. You ought to find out about it, and you ought to do it. It's run by the Methodist Church, but it's ecumenical, and that's not intended to be a commercial, but I had to since I'm in the Methodist Church, and we're members of the Methodist Church, so there you go. But you know, um, churches are interesting places, and I know that the, <clears throat> that the theme for Lent is brokenness to, to wholeness and healing. And I think that going back and, and thinking about Jesus, going back and looking at Jesus' teachings, <clears throat> excuse me, I would think that Jesus really rejects the idea that we're broken. I think that what Jesus would tell us is we have the right because God gave it to us. It's the greatest gift God gave us. We have the right to choose. We have free will. And we can choose to be broken or we can choose to be whole. But I think that when it comes down to it, we have in the Bible and in so many ways the teachings that we really need to be whole. The problem is we just don't choose to use them. We really don't totally buy in oftentimes to a lot of the things that we learn. So Jesus was resurrected and went into heaven. We have created a distance between him and us because of that. And I think that distance is only as much as we allow it to be. I think that God's voice is as loud as we want it to be. Case in point, and I don't recall the name of the person or the details. I heard this on a walk to Emmaus walk from one of the clergy in the few talks that we allowed them to do. No, the <laughs> clergy gets there. You know, all of those clergy guys, they can get going. When they're, when they're rolling, they're rolling. <laughs> so I heard a story from Andy, one of the, my favorite ministers on the, on the walks. And he was telling the story about a gentleman from England who was traveling to Africa to be a missionary back in the 1800s. And there was a place where the ship stopped before going on into the main part of Africa or wherever it was they were going. The pastor got off of the ship 
And when the ship sailed, he didn't get back on. And three days later, it was reported that the ship was lost at sea with all hands and all passengers. All the other people were gone. And somebody said to him, well, why weren't you on the ship? And he said, well, God told me and inspired me not to stay on the ship. And the person said, <clears throat> why were you selected? Why didn't God tell everybody? And what he said was, everyone could have heard the same voice, but no one else was listening. And I think that's the problem for most of us. We don't listen for the voice. We're busy praying. We're busy telling God what we want. But we don't listen to the voice. I've heard it, and I will tell you about that. I know that God can talk to us just as clearly as you hear me. I know that that is something that people find difficult or will rationalize away, but it happened. And I think it happens to all of us in one way or another, but it can only be a loud, clear, ongoing communication if we choose to let it be so. God is always out there waiting for us. It's the whole story of the prodigal son all over again. But God is always ready to accept us back. But it's our choice. And if we don't truly, emotionally, in our hearts, absolutely, physically make that choice, and then do what we need to do to make it happen, then we'll not quite get there. Now, as I love to tell the story, at some point we'll probably die and we'll go to heaven and we'll get to heaven and probably we'll sit up in a cloud somewhere with harps playing in the background and we'll start to study and the more we study, the more we'll progress and the more we progress, the more we'll study and we're going to study and study and study and progress and progress and progress and as Mark Twain says, if that isn't hell, I don't know what is, but <laughs> God's going to get me for that. But he knows I'm only funning. But, you know, the, the fact is it really is all about choice. My life, like everyone's life, has been a series of choices. Some of the early choices were not mine, but they were made for me and set the pattern of how I was to live. When I was born, I was put in an incubator. I was born two months early, only two pounds, 13 ounces, and I really haven't gained too much since then. <laughs> Well, I've been working at losing. I've lost 60 pounds in the last year and a half, so don't talk to me about losing weight. Yeah. Um, so I was put in an incubator, and my retinas did not develop properly, and so I lost my eyesight. Now, even back in February of 1950, there were rumors beginning that putting a child in an incubator in a pure oxygen-rich environment for several days could cause blindness. And even introducing air and not a pure oxygen environment for just a few minutes every day would be sufficient to prevent blindness. A gentleman named Arnold Papps from Johns Hopkins University Wilmer Eye Institute discovered that. He had proven it by subjecting several children to a not pure oxygen environment, looking at other cases around the country where children were not put in a pure oxygen environment. He discovered out of 75 children who did not receive pure oxygen for the entire time, and I mean literally maybe minutes a day, for the entire time they were in an incubator, the, the results of blindness dropped to zero. But when he submitted a grant to the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, they said, you're crazy, that's not good science, how can anybody get poisoned from oxygen? We know that's not totally true today. And so as a result, medical science even then wasn't listening. It wasn't until a little bit later that they finally recognized that they didn't need to use the treatments that they were. But by that time it was too late and I had gone blind. When it was discovered that I had gone blind, my parents were told by the, well, by the ophthalmologist, by all of the doctors, put him in a home. There is no way that a blind person could ever amount to anything, and all he's going to do is be a drain and a burden on your entire family. And we know that that's not going to be good, so you really should just send him away now. My father with an eighth grade education and my mother with a high school diploma rejected that. They rejected the thinking of the best minds of the day because they knew in their hearts that wasn't right. 
That was their choice. They taught me that I could do whatever I wanted to do, as long as it was right, as long as it was morally okay, as long as the ethics were good. And they gave me, I think, as good a grounding in that as, as any kid could have. So we grew up, occasionally washed the dishes and did all those things that kids have to do, even tried to mow the lawn a little bit and did some of that. But when I moved from Chicago when I was five to Southern California, I was in a pretty rural area. In Chicago, I got to play with the other kids, and I also had one of those little pedal cars, you know, that you kind of ride around if you're a kid, and rode it around the house and whizzed from room to room, and got through the doors and all that okay and so on. But one day I was pedaling around, not paying attention like I should. The car hood went under a coffee table. My chin found the coffee table, and I was still a little bumped from the scar because they had to put three stitches in to close it. And all my mother said was, you gotta watch where you're going. <laughs> but think about that. Think about what would you do if you had a blind kid and that happened. Think about what most people would do. Oh my God, we can't let this kid get hurt. We can't let this happen. They take the car away. My mother didn't do that. She said, you gotta watch where you're going. Of course, in the dictionary, to see is to perceive. It's not just seeing with your eyes. You sighted bigots, you, you don't think that way. It's all about perception. And so <clears throat> I, in fact, learned to watch where I was going. I learned to listen better and not ignore the signs. So when we moved to Palmdale, California, out in San Andreas Fault Country, I learned to ride a bike and rode a bike around the neighborhood. The sounds of the tires making noise on the road, all the other echoes around allowed me to know just as well as anyone if there were parked cars in front of me so I could avoid them or stop or if I was getting too close to the curb or any of the kinds of things that people do when they're riding a bike. Because I learned that there were alternatives to using eyesight. In fact, I never even thought about it. I just did it. It was as natural to me as it was for you when you were riding bikes and maybe you still do ride bikes. But the fact is that it was a natural kind of progression because I grew up thinking that if I wanted to ride a bike, I could ride a bike. I walked to school, I rode a bike to school. The school was a few blocks away, I rode myself. Sometimes I rode with my brother, sometimes I didn't. I knew how to get to the school, I knew how to get to the bike rack. And then I knew how to get from there to wherever I needed to go in the school because I learned that I could travel independently and do that. Now at the time, the one thing that I didn't do was use a cane or a dog. Dog, too young to get a dog. Cane, didn't know it. And a cane or a dog only is going to help you find and avoid geography, things that get in your way. A dog or a cane will help you walk safely, but they don't know where you want to go. And in fact, with dogs who have the brains and can figure out if you go somewhere all the time, oh, well, we need to go this way. I don't want that because I want the dog to be working just to keep me safe. It's my job to know where I want to go and how to get there. How do I do that? There are technologies and ways that I make that happen. Today, it's a lot better. We have talking GPS systems and all sorts of stuff. Back then, it was even more memorization than now. I personally still like to memorize as much as possible and verify or do new things with a GPS, but still prefer to memorize things. So anyway, I went to school, <clears throat> went to high school. <clears throat> in my freshman year in high school, after having gotten my first guide dog, Squire, before going into high school, I ran into my first real problem where I was told I was different and not as good as everyone else. Now, I'd gotten Squire in June and July of 1964. And as I describe it now, what I really learned when I got a guide dog was not all the footwork and not the commands, but I learned how to build a team. And I learned back when I was 14 in 1964, so that means I'm how old? Do the math. Carry it over. 50, 63. Okay. Um, got to think faster. There'll be another math problem later. So. I learned about building a team, and I learned I was the team leader. I had to be in control of the team. I had to tell the dog where to go, forward, left, right, and so on. 
But I also learned that the other member of the team had a responsibility. We walk up to a street corner. We stop. The dog will stop at a curb. And then I have to listen to hear the way the traffic's going. If the traffic is going the way I'm facing and want to go, it's probably safe to cross, although I'll probably wait for a light cycle just to make sure I didn't get there at the end. If the traffic is going across in front of me, I learned even before high school physics, two pieces of matter don't occupy the same space at the ta same time in a classical mechanics world. We're not going to deal with quantum physics today. <laughs> but in a classical mechanics, simple, slow world, Two pieces of matter don't occupy the same space at the same time. Now, the thing that they don't tell you in physics, they expect you to know, you know, it's the, one of those, the rest has left us an exercise for the student kind of thing. What I, what I didn't learn from them, but I figured out on my own without getting killed, was there, there's a corollary to that law, which goes, the bigger piece of matter usually wins. <laughs> so if it's a car, I'm probably going to get smushed. So it's really not a good idea to walk out in front of one of those things, because it's going to occupy my space, and then there won't be much left of me. So. I wait until the traffic is going the way I want to go. I tell the dog to go forward. We step down off the curb. We start walking across the street, and suddenly the dog jerks back. I have to let her or him do their job. And my responsibility as the team leader is to recognize and respect the job the other, do the other person is doing. I was going to say the other dog, but the other person or team member is doing. That's what teamwork is about on any team in any level. It's all about knowing that every member of the team has a job to do. Don't discourage them from doing their job. By the way, I think that's what works with God, too. Now, there's always the point zero 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 one chance that the dog was jerking back because uh, he saw a duck and wanted to go play. But mostly when they see ducks, they don't want to go play because they take their jobs really seriously. You can't imagine how seriously these dogs take their job and wanting to keep us safe and, and I suppose at the most basic level, wanting to please. They actually can stress out because they take it so seriously. And that's why they respond so well to praise when they do a good job. You listening? <laughs> She's sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> she says, I don't expect anything else. So it's a team relationship. When we got to high school, as I said, and I learned that I was really not considered as good as anyone else. Because it came to be late February, early March of 1965. I had just gotten my Star Scout Award, actually the, uh, the year before went to this uh, scouting court of honor, a guy named George Cartosian, who was a lawyer, actually presented the awards and led the court of honor. Anyway, I was called into the vice principal's office one day, and Mr. Fisher said, we've got a word from our superintendent. In the manual, the student manual for the Antelope Valley High School District, there is a rule that says that no live animals are allowed on the bus. And our superintendent says, because of that, you have to ride another way to get to school. You cannot be on a school bus. So think about that. What he's saying is, I'm blind and I can't ride on the school bus because I choose to use a guide dog. Now, their solution was they were going to hire a car to take me to school. They were going to pay somebody to do that. Well, under the law, what do you think that makes that car? But you know, they weren't thinking about facts at the time. Now, that law, that, that high school ruling, by the way, also flew in the face of California state penal law, which said that a blind person accompanied by a guide dog had the right to take that dog anywhere they go. Well, my father hit the roof, of course, when we learned about it, but I was off the bus. We demanded a meeting with the school board. We got a meeting with the school board. The chair of the school board was our friend, Mr. Cartosian. The superintendent was there. They went through some other business and finally called us and the superintendent got up and he said, this is really simple. We have a rule. No live animals allowed on the school bus. That's all there is to it. He can't ride the bus. That's it. My dad got up and said, well, if that's the case, then somebody's going to spend a year in the penitentiary because there is a law that says, section 643.5 of the state penal code, that says that blind people can take their dog on any public transportation into any public place, any public lodging, restaurants, and so on, including use and common carriers. My father spent a Saturday in the library, not knowing anything about the law, but 
knowing enough to read and think and use his head, and discovered in Black's Law Dictionary that a common carrier was, by case law and by legislation, included in the class of vehicles known as common carriers. And my dad said all of that to the board and said, so who's it going to be? <laughs> and the superintendent turned to Mr. Cartosian in this very flip way and said, is he right? Mr. Cartosian, with a little smile on his face, said, yep. I remember it. But the board voted three to two to support the superintendent. My father, not one to give up, knowing when he's right, wrote the governor of the state of California and laid it all out. We don't know what happened. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall, but what we did hear later was that the superintendent was summoned to Sacramento. He went up there and was there on a Thursday and all we know is that he came back battered and bloodied and the next week I was back on the school bus. Now the superintendent is a bully anyway, but the messages I got from that were two. One, I really am different. People don't necessarily care to do the right thing and clearly they don't necessarily think I'm as good as anyone else because I can't see. <clears throat> the other message though was you can fight City Hall and win. And I think the second somewhat more canceled out the first, so I don't think it was a break-even situation. But at the same time, the message was clear. Well, over the next several years, I had various situations and instances where I learned in one way or another that I was really regarded as different. Mostly we worked through those things. And I also learned that there were other blind people who thought as I did. Those people are part of an organization called the National Federation of the Blind, which was started by Dr. Jacobus Tenbrook in 1940. Dr. Tenbrook is one of the foremost constitutional law scholars of the 20th century. His case law treatises are still used today. Dr. Tenbrook in one of the most profound articles he ever wrote entitled The Law of Torts, um, let's see, I wanna make sure I say it right, The Right to Live in the World, The Disabled and the Law of Torts. And what he said was, I think extremely beautiful, that all of us, disabled or able-bodied alike, do have the same right to live in the world. God gave us all the same right to live in the world. And if we have bridges and if we have beliefs that we're not as equal as anyone else, that's our doing. Yes, society may have made it so, but there are a whole lot of uninformed people in the world about one thing or another. The fact of the matter is, God's laws are really clear. And we do have the right to live in the world. We were given the right to choose. Well, now jump forward many years. I had gotten a job working for a company, uh, actually first working for the National Federation of the Blind. By the way, after graduating from the University of California at Irvine with a master's degree in physics, and I want to acknowledge someone um, who just found an old longtime friend from UC Irvine who lives here in Dallas, Greg and Peggy Maxwell. Um, Greg is a captain for American Airlines, go American. Um, Greg and I went to school together, and we've just reconnected in the back of the room. Um, UC Irvine, go anteaters all the way. <laughs> Although I must it say, go frogs, you know, so. <laughs> I try. <laughs> and got my horns. So the fact of the matter is um, I went through school, went through college, got a master's degree in physics, worked at the campus radio station, and, and held my own for many years against Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes. We played old radio shows on Sunday night, and we learned how popular our show was one day when a deputy from the Orange County Jail called and said, we want you to know that the, the jail is divided. Half of them want to watch 60 Minutes in television, but half of them want to listen to your show on Sunday night, so we do special TV arrangements, and we get half of them to one floor and half of them to another floor. Half watch Wallace and half watch you. And uh, so I figured that we did pretty good at smushing Wallace, you know. Wallace, Wallace associated with criminals anyway. We ever hear of a radio show called The Green Hornet? He narrated it for years. So, you know, he's associated with crooks himself. So. <laughs> but anyway, I graduated. I worked for the National Federation of the Blind on some projects and then was hired by a company that later was bought by Xerox. 
While working for that company, I had to fly from LA to San Francisco. I had actually flown out from Boston to LA and then go on from LA to San Francisco. I stepped on the airplane to fly from LA to San Francisco with an airline called PSA, a bunch of sleazeballs. And um, Greg, you never worked for PSA, did you? No. Good, just checking. <laughs> and I was told I couldn't fly on that airplane because I had a guide dog. And I couldn't sit anywhere but the very front row of the airplane because I, that was the only place the pilot was going to let me sit, even though I knew that the airline policy said that I could sit where I wanted to sit. I was literally thrown off the airplane by the police. Well, we sued with the help of the National Federation of the Blind. Now think about it. The reason I don't like to sit in the bulkhead is if there are turbulence and planes bounces, because it happened to me, there's nothing to restrain the dog. If I sit in a non-bulkhead row, the dog goes under the seat in front of me and her head comes back and between my legs and she's secure. And even if she panics, she's very much under control in that environment. The pilot didn't care. It was his way or the highway. So we went to court. We eventually settled the court, but more important, PSA went out of business. So I think I won anyway. <laughs> So I worked in the workforce for a long time and eventually was hired by a company called Quantum Corporation to open an office in New York City. <clears throat> Quantum did a lot of sales in the city through distribution and through other means, but didn't have a sales presence. Well, I was asked to open an office. By that time, I had owned my own company for a while. I sold it, went back into the workforce and so on, and I knew a lot about management because I learned how to do that with dogs and people. So on August 1st, 2000, we opened our office on the 78th floor of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. On September 11th, 2001, I was in my office because we were going to be conducting some special seminars to teach resellers how to sell our products. I was the only resident of the office who was in that day. My sales force was out working, supporting their manager by selling. They didn't need to come to the seminar. The only other quantum person who was there besides my fifth guide dog, Roselle, and me was a gentleman named David Frank. David was from our corporate office in California. David was born in the Bronx. He relocated to California. What do you want? I went to, was born in Chicago, lived in California, now living in New York. So we traded coasts. Um, but he was there that day. At 8.45 in the morning, we had some guests in our conference room. David and I were in my office doing some final preparations so that we could give security information about who was attending the seminar. Suddenly, we heard a muffled explosion. The building shuddered. And then if you imagine my hand as the tower, literally the tower began to lean. It started to move. It kept going sort of southwest right toward Tower 2. It kept tipping and tipping. We moved about 20 feet. We learned later that buildings are made to be flexible like that. I had participated in all the emergency evacuation preparedness drills, fire drills, and so on. I learned how to get around the World Trade Center because I needed to do that to be able to function. I can't rely on other people for that because I'm not going to take people away from other things just to lead me around. And I don't need to have people just lead me around, especially in an area that I know well. I learned the geography. I learned where everything is. I knew where the Este Lade second store was on the 46th floor of Tower 2. <laughs> Made my wife very happy. And I knew how to get anywhere that I needed to go, not only in the World Trade Center, but elsewhere. But the building, as I said, was tipping. And I had been prepared as much as I could be for an emergency. And you know what? The more I think about it, something else was happening that I think was God telling me something. Every day I went in, I kept thinking, what are you going to do if there is an emergency? Because there had been a bombing, of course, in 1993. We weren't there at the time. But I thought about that every day. And I always kept thinking, what are you going to do? So that prepared me as much as anything, I think, for 9-11, although I didn't realize it until much later. But as the building tip, I went over to the doorway. You know, we grew up in Palmdale. Building moves, go to doorway. Roselle was asleep under my desk. That was the name of my fifth guy dog. David was just holding on to my desk, and he wanted to stay there. So he did. The building tipped. We finally said goodbye to each other because we had no idea what was going on, and we thought we were about to take a 78-floor plunge to the street. Then the building stopped, and it slowly started coming back the other way. Slowly, slowly, it tipped up, up. 
And finally, it got to be vertical again. As soon as it did, I went into my office, and I met my guide dog, Roselle, coming out from under my desk. Africa, wake up, sit. <laughs> I met, met Roselle coming out from under my desk. I told her to heal, which meant to come around on my left side and to sit, which she did. <laughs> Yawning and wagging her tail, obviously sleep disturbed, and then suddenly the building dropped straight down about six feet. Now today we know that that's because the expansion joints were going back into their normal configuration. Roselle just sat there, wagging her tail, yawning, giving me an occasional nudge, what's going on here? As soon as the building dropped, David turned and looked out the window and started shouting, Oh my God, Mike, there's fire and smoke and there are millions of pieces of burning paper falling outside the window. We can't stay here. We've got to get out of here right now. And I said, slow down, David. And he said, no, 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 we've got to get out of here right now. I could hear debris falling outside the window. We didn't smell smoke because the airplane hit 18 floors above us on the other side of the building. None of us knew what had happened. We knew something did. But we didn't know what. Now, the press oftentimes later said, well, of course, you didn't know you couldn't see it. And I said, wait a minute, you guys, start using your heads. Do any of you have x-ray vision? If you were in my office, could you see up 18 floors and through the walls to the other side of the building? Uh, no. Well, of course, nobody knew. It wasn't me. The problem with most of society is that they think that blindness is the end all. It's, it's a tragedy, it's felt, because people believe eyesight is the only game in town. It's not. The reality is that you guys have your own disability. You're light dependent. You rely on, eye, on lights and eyesight. And you don't know how to do it any other way. Thomas Edison fixed it for you by inventing the electric light bulb. But the fact of the matter is that's only a band-aid covering up your disability. <laughs> and if you think that's not true, just go stand in Penn Station during a power failure and try to find the train track you want. No lights, no windows, nothing to tell you. For a fee, I'll get you where you need to go. <laughs> And the longer the power failure goes on, the fee goes up. <laughs> but the fact is that blindness isn't the handicap. It's attitudes and perceptions that are the handicap. The unemployment rate among blind people is over 70%. Shouldn't be that way, but it is, because it's not that we can't see. It's that people think that because we can't see, we can't do the job. It happens all the time. In the world today, there are, in the United States, there are blind people who make as low as three cents an hour because there is a special government exemption in certain situations that allows certain organizations to pay blind people less and other physically disabled people less than minimum wage because we're not viewed as equal and competitive. Fact. So everybody go get your Congress people to support HR 831 to get rid of that exemption because there is no reason that I or anyone should ever be in a position to be paid less than minimum wage just like everyone else. Period. In any case, David is shouting, we got to get out of here. Our guests began to scream. They started moving toward our exit. And I said, David, slow down. And he said, no, we got to get out of here right now. We can't stay here. And I said, slow down. No, we got to get out of here. And then the big line, you can't see it. You don't understand. Excuse me. Building moved 20 feet. Building came back. Building dropped. You're seeing fire and smoke and debris, and I'm hearing the debris. No question about getting out. But I was observing something that David wasn't that made all the difference for me. Namely, I was experiencing the fact that a dog was sitting next to me, not in any way indicating that she felt nervous or concerned. You've read stories about animals that got their humans out of buildings and so on just because they detected fire and smoke before the people did. Roselle wasn't detecting anything that indicated she was bothered. Down, you can go to sleep again. <laughs> That told me that whatever was going on, we could work to get out at that moment without panicking. I said, finally, when I got David to focus, take our guests to the stairs, get them started down the stairs, and then we will leave the building. He did. I called my wife, Karen, while that was going on. 
Karen was at our home in Westfield, New Jersey, and I said, there was an explosion or something that happened, and we're going to have to leave the, the World Trade Center. She said, what's going on? I said, I don't know. We really don't know. It was long before the media got the story. I said, I just don't know. Now, I should tell you, by the way, Karen has physical disability. Karen uses a wheelchair. She reads, I push, great marriage. <laughs> when I was growing up in the 60s, it was, you know, the hippie culture and the drug stuff and all that, and people would ask me what I wanted to be, and, you know, I don't have any kind of sense of humor, you understand. So I said to people, well, you know, when I grow up, I want to be a pusher, man, you know. I wanna, you know. <laughs> so I married Karen, and I'm a pusher, and it's legal. <laughs> Just try to arrest me for it. What are you? I'm a pusher, man. Oh, you're on a row. No, 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 no. Actually, now she uses a power chair because her shoulders are starting to give out a little bit, so now I have to run for my life and watch my toes, but it's okay. She's run over them a few times, and it's always my fault. It usually is, so that's okay. I don't mind. If it's her, it's okay. Anyway, so I told her <clears throat> we were leaving. I hung up. David came back. We swept the office. We made sure nobody else was there. We powered down some equipment because we knew we weren't going to be back for a while. There was some stuff that we couldn't power down, although I would have liked to. But we didn't know we were never coming back. We left. We went to the stairs, and we started down. By 8.50 in the morning, we were at the stairs and started down. <clears throat> Immediately, I began smelling an odor. And I, and I recognized it, but I couldn't place it. I knew it was familiar, and finally, after a couple of floors, I realized I was smelling kind of the, the burning kerosene, propane, and all that, of burning jet fuel, the fumes from burning jet fuel. And I observed to other people, you know, I did a lot of traveling, even back then, for, for my jobs. I'm always at airports smelling that stuff. So I said to people around me on the stairs, I'm smelling the fumes from burning jet fuel. And they went, oh, you're right, that's what we're smelling. We tried to figure it out. We must have been hit by an airplane. So we assumed we were hit by an airplane as we went down the stairs, but we didn't know, and nobody was telling us anything. I like information. I don't care when or what. I would rather know all there is to know. But I know why they didn't tell people on the stairs. They didn't want more panic. It would have been helpful for me, but that's me. In any case, we went down the stairs. We got down about 10 floors when suddenly we heard from up above, there's a burn victim coming through. Move to the side of the stairs. We moved to the side of the stairs, and then some people passed us surrounding a woman who was very badly burned over the upper part of her body. Probably from the fuel vapors that ignited around her somewhere. We went a few floors more and then heard it again. Burn victim coming through. Please move to the side. Another person more badly burned even than the first passed us. I think we all realized how bad it had to be above after that second person passed because a woman near us on the stairs suddenly stopped and said, I can't breathe, I can't go on. We're not going to make it out of here. And all of us on the stairs stopped and surrounded her, all of us in our little group. We didn't all know each other, but we stopped and worked together and surrounded her and literally had a group hug and said, look, we're in this together. Come on, you can do it. Roselle was giving her kisses and I just said, you can do it, come on. Other people said, yeah, come on, you can do it. We're all together. We're going to help you. We're all in this. You help us. We help you. We're working together. She was able to keep going. Teamwork. A few floors after that, my friend David said, Mike, we're going to die. We're not going to make it out of here. And I just said, stop it, David. If Rosella and I can go down these stairs, so can you. He told me later that snapping at him like that, which was deliberate, brought him back. He said, I brought him out of his funk. He then walked ahead of us, a floor below us, down the stairs and did something that he said was really to take his mind off of everything he was worried about. He started shouting up everything that he saw. Oh, I'm at the 48th floor. Everything is good here. He took the responsibility to do that because he thought that he would be helping me, which he was. But he was also helping the hundreds of people above who, and even below, I guess, who could hear his voice. He gave people something to focus on. I think it's one of the most incredible memories I have of 9-11 that he did that. 47th floor, everything is good, everything is clear. Hey, I'm at the 46th floor, the 45th floor. I'm at the 44th floor, this is where the Port Authority cafeteria is not stopping. 43, keeping on going down the stairs. We were a floor above him, we kept going. I kept focusing on Africa. That was my job and my crutch, if you will. Good girl. I was led to just really praise her even more. And I just kept getting this thought. Keep praising her. So will you keep her calm? Keep praising her. I knew it, but 
it's always good to have those extra voices telling me that. Good girl, Africa, forward, down 10 steps. I kind of counted just to find out how many steps there were between floors. Forward, down the 10 stairs, left, left, 180 degrees, forward, down nine steps. Next floor down, 42, everything is good. Forward, down 10 steps, left, left, good girl, forward, good girl, down nine steps, good job, left, left, and continuing down the stairs. I started thinking, I wonder how many stairs we're gonna go down here. You know, that's the bizarre, strange mind looking for the factoid of the day. <laughs> Never heard factoid until later, but anyway, so I said, well, okay, here it is, right? We're going down 19 stairs between floors, going down from 78 to, seven to, to 1, that's 77 floors. 77 times 19 is? <laughs> Math exercise, come on. Nobody? 1,400. Yeah, yeah. Get your iPhones out. 1,463 stairs. And I didn't even have a calculator. So, and I figured it out and I went, oh, that's interesting. God, do we got to do all that? Um, and I said, I'm not going to think about that. That's going to get me tired. Good girl, Roselle, keep going. <laughs> and we kept going down the stairs. But I did have a fear. And by about the 39th or the 38th floor, I finally had to deal with it. Now, all y'all have uh, flown on airplanes. Catch that? All y'all have <laughs> flown on airplanes. And, you know, at the beginning, the flight attendants come out and they say, we have a briefing and we're going to... We're going to make sure that you're aware of what to do, so you fasten your seatbelts, and the way you fasten your seatbelts is you put the metal end into the buckle, and so on, and so on, and so on, as if we don't know how to fasten seatbelts, but it's probably good, because I'm amazed that some people never do figure it out. But anyway, the flight attendants give their briefing. Why do they do that? They do that, yeah, because the FAA tells them to do that, but they also do it um, because they want to do their best to make sure that people know. And they're also looking around to see who's paying attention to the briefing because they might need those people later on. Now, it's interesting when they give me a briefing for the longest time, and it still happens every so often. I'll get on an airplane. I like to sit as close to the front as possible, not bulkhead. So I got on an airplane, find my seat, and the flight attendant comes back, and they said, oh, we have to give you a briefing. I said, great. You know, I fly a lot. I really understand it, but uh, go ahead. And they, they say whatever they're going to say, or they say, oh, you really know? And I said, yeah, there's only one question I have. Tell me the seat numbers of the overwing emergency exit rows. Because I never know when the flight seat configuration is going to change, um, and so on. So I always want to make sure I know those row numbers. The flight attendants usually come back and say, oh, you don't need to worry about that because you came in through the front door of the aircraft. I didn't know that. You came in through the front door of the aircraft, and if there's an emergency, you're near the front, and you go out that door. And I said, no, 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 no. I want to know where the overwing exits are. But you don't need to know that. I said, can you assure me with 100% absolute positiveness that that door won't be jammed when we land and crash? Uh, no. Good. What are the overwing exit numbers? <laughs> well, I don't know. That's the real issue. They don't never ever memorize it, which is extremely unfortunate. I've heard now some flight attendants work it into their briefing. The overwing exits are located on this aircraft at rows 20 and 21 or at row 15 and 16. And that's great because we all should know it. You don't know what the cabin conditions will be like in an emergency. You don't know when this cabin might be full of smoke. I've heard of it happening. And the bottom line is we ought to be doing anything we can to make sure that everybody is prepared as we could be on a flight. And so they should be saying those row numbers as part of their briefing. But they don't. But I make them go back and get it. And then they come back and they say, OK, the exit row numbers on this plane are 20 and 21 or whatever. But you don't need to worry about that because well, here's what's going to happen. We're going to get the passengers off, then we'll come back and get you. <laughs> and I said, excuse me? Oh, we're going to get the passengers off, and we'll come back and get you. I said, I want a refund. Because if you don't consider me a passenger, then why am I paying for this seat? Oh, we didn't mean it that way, but that's what she said. Here's the bottom line. I'll be waiting at the bottom of that slide to catch you when you come down. I'm not waiting for anyone, <laughs> and neither do I need to. I walked on this airplane all by myself. I walked on the jet bridge. I am now executive platinum on American. Um, I think I know something about how to deal with airplanes. My advantage number is so old that there aren't any letters in it. It goes back to 1980 when the 
program started. Oh, but it's the perception that people have. Some are better than others, and now I've made friends with lots of flight attendants on American over the years, so more of them than no than not, so they'll come back. Okay, the exit row numbers are, yep, great, appreciate that. Hi, Connie, what's happening? So anyway, um, it, people are, are amazing. In any case, my fear going down the stairs was that we might lose power and lighting and then I'd be stuck on the stairs with thousands of functionally blind people who couldn't find their way out of a paper bag. Remember I said I had this fear that I really had to deal with. So I shouted to people because I thought maybe some people would pay attention if it became necessary. Hey everybody, if the power and lights go out I don't want you to worry. I happen to be blind. I've got my guide dog Roselle here. My name's Mike and we're offering a half price special to get you out today only. <laughs> And I did that partly to be humorous because conversation was kind of dying down and I really didn't want people getting morbid or, or going in themselves and being like David. And so I simply said that. But I also wanted people who might be further along to think about it and if we really did lose power I might have some aids that I could quickly teach how to help people get down the stairs and then we could all get everybody out just as safely as before. It was intentional. So we continued down the stairs, 35, 34, 33. I uh, was noticing conversation was getting quiet again, so at one point I just said, hey everybody, you know, they're not going to allow us back into the tower for a while, but on the first day back, why don't we all meet on the 78th floor at 8.45 in the morning and walk down the stairs together? What a great way to lose weight, huh? I didn't ever suggest that we meet at the bottom and walk up. I'm not dumb. I took physics and got a master's degree. I know about that gravity stuff. <laughs> 32, 31. Hey, I'm at the 30th floor, everybody. I see firemen coming up the stairs. Be sure to let them by. Well, I went on down to where David was because David stopped. Um, and he said, I see the firemen. I said, well, what are you seeing? He said, well, they're all dressed in their heavy protective clothing. They got a bunch of stuff on their backs. They might have 100 pounds on their backs. I think it was like 40 or 50 pounds, but who knew? He said, they're carrying oxygen cylinders, fire axes, shovels, all their breathing stuff, all the things they needed to fight the fire. And then the first guy gets to us and he stops in front of me. He goes, hey, buddy, you okay? You know how they talk back there in New York? They talk funny. <laughs> Just like Sonny Corleone, you know? Anyway. And I, and I said, yeah, we're really good. Well, that's really nice. We're going to send somebody down the stairs with you to make sure you get out okay. I said, you don't need to do that. Well, yeah, but we're going to do that anyway. I said, look, you really don't need to do that. I walked all the way down from the 78th floor. Here we are on floor 30. You can't get lost on stairs. <laughs> sort of like jet bridges going down to airplanes. You know, you really can't get too lost. And, you know, you can't get lost walking up and down the aisle of an airplane either. But anyway, so I, I just said, look, we're really okay. Well, that's really nice, but we're going to help you get out. I really didn't want help because I didn't need somebody grabbing onto me and every time I stepped down, he'd lift me up to make sure that I didn't hit the stairs too hard. And that happens all too often. Or just not letting me go at my own pace. Or not letting me do what the dog and I needed to do to function. That's what it's all about. I said to him, look, I've got a guide dog, Roselle here, she and I are great. Well, what a nice guide dog, and he starts petting Roselle. It wasn't the time to give him a lecture, don't pet a guide dog in harness because the dog is working. It also wasn't the time to give him a lecture about the fact that blindness wasn't the handicap, it's society's attitudes that are handicapped. I just said, look, we really are okay, I've got a friend over here, David, who can see. He looked at David, and he says, you with him? And David said, yeah, look, he's really good, don't worry about it. Okay, well, all right, in that case, then we'll let you go. He gave Roselle some last pats. Roselle gave him some more kisses. Probably the last unconditional love he ever got as he then walked upstairs. Now why do I tell you that? I tell you that because I want you to understand that I recognize that the firefighters were a team. I didn't want to be responsible for somebody to be out of position, especially when I didn't need it. I didn't want somebody to not be where they were supposed to be and then somebody else get injured and I hear about it later and know that it was only because they were, quote, helping me and not doing what they really needed to do. I didn't need that assistance and it was not good for the team. I don't care how prepared they are. They're going up to fight that fire. All that equipment is important. They have to carry it up. I knew that already. So I wanted that team to stay together. <coughs> 
all of those responders truly were heroes, and I want to ask you to do me a favor and help me honor them. And I never do that by asking people to have a moment of silence for them. I think they would want us to remember them for the strength and courage that they showed and for the job that they were doing and respect that. Would you just please give a round of applause for all the heroes we lost on 9-11? We continued walking down the stairs. David reassumed his scouting position. On the 26th floor, somebody started passing up water bottles. They, um, they said, opened a water vending machine. I always wondered what open meant. But uh, anyway, they opened a water vending machine and they passed up bottles of water. Roselle was panting. We gave her some water. We kind of made our hands into cups, David and I. We gave her water. We took some water and we continued on down. Roselle was doing great. I should tell you that that morning at 12.30, she woke me up because there was a thunderstorm that was approaching the house and Roselle was afraid of thunder. Roselle shivers and shakes whenever there's thunderstorms and she detects them in advance. So we went down to my office and stayed there for an hour and a half. Messed up my sleep, but you know, that's okay. For Roselle, we do it. But then we went back to bed and um, the rest happened as I'm telling you. She just did great, but she was thirsty. So we gave her water and we continued down. We finally made it down to the first floor. David was a floor ahead. When he got there, he said, hey, the water sprinklers are running. There's a curtain of water that's coming um, down that's blocking the exit. I figured out later it must be to keep fire in or out if it happened to come on the stairs or come into the first floor lobby. So we went through that water, burst out into Tower One's lobby, which typically would be a quiet office lobby, but now it was ankle deep in water and there were a lot of people shouting, go this way, don't go that way, don't go outside, go this way. A guy comes up to me and he says, I'm with the FBI, and I'm sitting there going, I didn't do it. Um, I, I just said, well, what's going on? He said, well, we don't have time. I'm just telling you I'm with the FBI. Well, who's here? Well, the FBI, the New York police, the Port Authority police, the fire department, we're getting people out, we're taking care of everything thing, come this way. And he got us to the revolving doors that took us out into the central part of the complex. He said, follow these people, go through the complex, and leave by the far exits. David and I ran through the central part of the World Trade Center, which on the first floor was a shopping mall, and it had all the usual sorts of things that you would find there. And we just ran through, could hear your footfalls as you ran. Normally there were thousands of people in that place, but now it was just empty as it had been evacuated. We finally went up an escalator and at 9.45, an hour after the plane hit the building, we were outside. We were told to leave the complex, but first David looked around and he said, Mike, I see fire in tower two. I said, what are you talking about? He said, there's fire in the second tower. We didn't know. So we walked over to Broadway and we turned north and started walking north on the west side of Broadway so there was a building right to our left and Broadway was to our right. We crossed several streets, finally got to Ann Street which put us right diagonally across from Tower 2 of the World Trade Center. David wanted to stop and take pictures. I wanted to try to call Karen and let her know we got outside. So I took out my phone, I called and the circuits were busy. I couldn't get through. We didn't know that people were saying goodbye to their loved ones who were up in the towers and who weren't going to come down alive. We didn't know any of that. I had just put my phone away and David was putting his camera away when a police officer yelled, get out of here, it's coming down right now. We heard this rumble that became this deafening roar. I describe it as kind of a combination of a freight train and a waterfall. You could hear debris falling, metal clattering, glass clinking and breaking and crashing and this white noise of the whole towers collapsing. David turned and ran. He was gone. Everybody was running. Literally, I bodily lifted Roselle, turned 180 degrees and started running back the way I came, now going south on Broadway with the building right on my right hand side. And as soon as I started to run, I thought, God, I can't believe that you got us out of a building just to have it fall on us. That was probably the time that I was losing it as much as anything. But the next thing that happened is really, for me, the crux of the story. I heard a voice in my head as clearly as you hear me, and the voice said, don't worry about what you can't control. Focus on running with Roselle, and the rest will take care of itself. And I'm telling you, I heard that as clearly as you hear me. God talks to us. Do we listen? Yeah, it was loud that day, but I must have been listening. And I think that we can hear that voice anytime we want if we really learn to listen well. That's why I think that 
we're not broken, we let ourselves be, and we don't listen for the guidance to make us whole. We try to take control over things over which we don't have control. We don't focus on the things over which we do have control, and that's the issue. I also, when I heard that voice, had this sudden conviction and peace that if Roselle and I worked together, we truly would be okay. And that was nothing new for a guide dog team, but what a reminder and what a feeling to get it right then as we ran and I knew we'd be okay. We got to the corner of Fulton Street and Broadway, turned right, now going west on Fulton Street, ran a little bit, caught up to David. David stopped realizing that he had just run off in fear and he was going to come back and try to find me. I said, David, don't worry about it as he apologized. I said, we're, we're okay, let's keep going, the building's coming down. And we ran and then suddenly we were engulfed in the dust cloud. All the dirt and debris and dust, uh, the fine particles of Tower 2 as it collapsed. The dust cloud was so thick, David said, you couldn't see your hand six inches in front of your nose. I can tell you it was so thick that I felt the debris as it went down my throat with every breath I took. We were breathing in more of that stuff than we were breathing in air as we ran. We knew we had to get out of it or we would be dead. We would suffocate. So I, as, we, as we ran, I told Roselle, right, right. I don't know whether she could hear me or see my hand signals. Right, right, good girl, keep going, but right, right. Suddenly, I heard an opening on my right-hand side. I turned, but Roselle had beat me to it. She turned as she was supposed to do. She turned, she took one step, and she stopped, and she wouldn't move. Focus on running with Roselle. I knew that if she stopped, there had to be a reason. So I kind of reached out a hand along the wall. I stuck a foot out, thinking what I might expect, and in fact, it was what I thought. She stopped at the top of a flight of stairs. She did her job perfectly. Everything I could ask her to do, even in all that thundering noise, she knew the difference. It wasn't a thunderstorm. She focused. That was what I asked for when I was getting Roselle. I said, I wanted a dog that when she's working, who knows how to focus. And when she's not, she can be a dog and play and be silly. And she is very, was very silly. She liked to steal socks and hide them, not chew them up, just steal them and hide them. <laughs> it's a game. So we walk down the stairs, we find ourselves in the lobby entrance to the Fulton Street subway station. At the bottom of the stairs there was a woman crying saying, help, help, my eyes are filled with dirt, somebody please help. I happened to be close to her, I reached out, I took her arm and I said, hey, my name is Mike, I'm blind, I've got my guide dog Roselle here, she'll make sure that neither of us fall down the stairs. You're not anywhere near them, you're okay. I knew the station. She wasn't anywhere near them, but I understood her fear. I said, what's your name? <coughs> she said her name was Carol. And I introduced myself and I said, you're okay. Go ahead and clean out your eyes. And we stood there and she was working on that. When a gentleman came up the stairs, he said his name was Lou. He was an employee of the subway station. He took all of us who were there at the moment down the stairs into the subway system to an employee locker room where there was a water fountain. We could kind of clear our lungs and sit on benches. There was a fan. And we just sat there trying to make sense of it all. Not a lot of talking. We were there about 10 minutes and a police officer came and said, the air is clear up above, you need to leave right now. We followed him because he just turned and left. We went up the stairs, we walked through the lobby of the little arcade, went upstairs outside and discovered, as David looked around and said, oh my God, Tower 2 is gone. The air was a little clearer. I said, David, what do you mean? What do you see? And he said, all I see are pillars of smoke. The tower's gone. You sure? Yeah, it's gone. We stood there for a couple of seconds, maybe a minute or so, and then just turned and continued to walk west on Fulton Street. Not even talking much. What could you say? We walked for about 10 minutes. We were well past the World Trade Center and then we heard that freight train waterfall sound again. We knew it was our tower coming down. We thought we were safe from debris, but David looked back and he said, there is another dust cloud coming. Let's move over here to the side out of the dust cloud. And we did. Covered our faces, hunkered down, closed our eyes, and waited for everything to pass and for the noise to subside. And after it did, we opened our eyes and looked around and David said, oh my God, Mike, there's no World Trade Center anymore. I said, what do you mean? He said, it's gone. Well, what do you see, David? All I see are fingers of fire and flame, hundreds of feet tall and pillars of smoke. The towers are gone. It's gone. 
We had gone into that complex three hours before just to do work, and then in the blink of an eye, it was gone. We stood there for a minute or so, and then I said, I've got to try to call Karen. This time, I got through, and she was the one who told us for the first time that two airplanes had deliberately been crashed into the towers, one into the Pentagon, and a fourth was still missing at that time over Pennsylvania. I had employees who were supposed to be coming in. As I said, my sales team was out. One of them was to be supposed to be going to Cantor Fitzgerald at 10 o'clock, which was up on about the 99th floor of Tower 1. He was pulling into the subway station, the path station under New York City and under the World Trade Center when Tower 2 was hit. There was this awful vibration and, and shaking of the train. He told me later the engineer wouldn't even let anyone off. They just sped back around and out to Hoboken, New Jersey. So he stood there and watched the towers coming down, not knowing about his colleague in the office, me, and what, what happened. <clears throat> We spent the rest of the day moving toward Midtown Manhattan, and later that night when I learned that the trains were running, I was able to get on a train and go home. Meanwhile, a longtime close friend of Karen's who was now also living in New Jersey, Tom Painter, had come down. Tom was a frequent visitor, and we would visit him. Good friend, and Karen had known him since high school in California. He came to be with her and with me if I were home, because he didn't know where I was, and it was sometime after he got there that I called and said that we were okay. He drove Karen to the train station, and at 7 o'clock that night, as I was getting off the train, I heard our van arrive. I walked down the stairs, across the sidewalk, up the ramp into our van, and finally got to hug Karen for the first time. Later, we were comparing notes, and we both realized we were thinking the same thing. What might else they be doing that would keep us apart? But we got back together. The next day, I called Guide Dogs for the Blind, where I got Roselle and all of my guide dogs. I did that in order to tell them that we had survived, because some of them had visited us, and I knew that they would be um, wondering if we were okay if they thought about us and suddenly remembered that, that they had been to the World Trade Center and seen us there. From that, a media story was released about us, and that went viral on the media. On the 14th of September, I made my first visit to Larry King Live first of five visits, um, was on a lot of TV after that. Even before 9-11, we wanted to move back to California, but Guide Dogs for the Blind offered me a position as National Public Affairs Director, spokesperson for the organization, and in February, I moved back to California to take that job. Karen joined me, and we stayed in a hotel for a few months while we uh, were getting a house modified for our use, um, and then uh, we stayed there, and we still live in Novato, California. It's about 27 miles north of San Francisco. We've actually lived there longer than we lived anywhere else. We've lived there since officially June of 2002. So we've, uh, we've been in the same house now for 10 years and eight months, and almost nine months. So it's kind of cool to be in one place. But in any case, in 2008, Guide Dogs ended the job that, uh, that I was doing for them. They decided that they didn't really need that anymore. So I started my own company to continue the same work, educating people, talking about change, talk about making choices, discussing the idea of teamwork and God in our lives, and telling people about blindness and blind people, saying it's time that we all become inclusive and that we truly learn from each other, and that we recognize we're all God's children, and that our job is to learn to listen to that voice. And our job is to recognize that we truly don't need to be broken, but it's up to us to fix that. We can't wait for God to do it, because God is waiting for us to do it. And God already, I believe, perceives us as whole people. And if we're not, it's our choice, not God's. I don't even think God is disappointed. God doesn't work that way. God just stands ready to help bring wholeness back. We have to decide to fix it. We have to learn to hear that voice. And we have to learn to recognize that each and every one of us can do it, no matter who we are, no matter what we do. 
I want to end by leaving you with some guide dog wisdom from Thunder Dog, the book that we wrote in 2010. It was published in 2011. It went right to the New York Times bestseller list. And I know we're basically out of books, so if you want more, you can go to my website, www.michaelhingson.com, and buy them. They'll come autographed and potographed with Roselle's paw print. We got it six days before she died in 2011. Also, um, Roselle is a winner of the American Hero Dog uh, Awards for 2011, the first award of its kind. So she was given it posthumously, but she won that, which is really pretty cool. And if you belong to any organization that needs a speaker, I'd love to chat with you. So you can find us at michaelhinkson.com and um, would love to work with you. And I've got cards and we can give you those as well. But I want to leave you with something from Thunderdog. Guide Dog Wisdom, Lessons I Learned from Roselle on 9-11. And it goes like this. Number one, there's a time to work and a time to play. Know the difference. When the harness goes on, it's time to work. Work hard. Others are depending on you. Number two, focus in and use all of your senses. Learn to tell the difference between a harmless thunderstorm and a true emergency. Don't let your sight get in the way of your vision. Number three, Sometimes the way is hard, but if you work together, someone will pass along a water bottle when you need it. Number four, I'm sure that this is Roselle's favorite, always, but always kiss firefighters. <laughs> Number five, ignore distractions. There's more to life than playing fetch or chasing tennis balls. Number six, listen carefully to those who are older and more experienced than you. They'll help you find the way. Number seven, don't stop until work is over. Sometimes being a hero is just doing your job. Number eight, the dust cloud won't last forever. Keep going and look for the way out. It will come. Number nine, shake off the dust and move on. Remember the first guide dog command forward. We make mistakes, folks. We can dwell on the mistakes, or we can learn lessons from the mistakes that we make. That's why I think God waits for us. So we blow it one particular time or another. Do we learn from it and get closer to God? That's the issue. Number 10, when work is over, play hard with your friends. And don't forget to share your favorite boat bone Everyone, thanks very much. Help the good guys win. Stay firm in your faith and we'll all really do well together. Thanks very much.